are just down the road from the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California at the Estancia La Jolla Spa and Hotel with Terry Sanofsky, who's a Francis Crick professor and head of the Computational Neurobiology Lab at the Salk, head of the Institute for Neural Computation over at UCSD and a Howard Hughes Medical in Institute investigator and one of only 10 living individuals, I think, who, who are members of all three nas national institutes. So it's great to have you here. The, there is an editorial um, on the 4th November issue of Science, which you did with Sidney Brenner, and it's called Understanding the Human Brain. And I would like to know, first, give me a quick summary of this. Why now? Why, why did you feel it was important to do this at this point? Well, every year the Society for Neuroscience has a major annual meeting. Uh, this year it will be in Washington, D.C., and 35,000 neuroscientists and exhibitors converge and uh, exchange the latest uh, results and advances in, in neuroscience, and it's uh, hard to even uh, comprehend how, um, how much is being done, and uh, every year Science Magazine has a special issue timed for that meeting, and uh, this was a guest editorial. Uh, Sidney Brenner is a senior fellow in the Crick Jacobs Center for Theoretical and Computational Biology that I direct, and uh, we have had a dialogue over the last five years uh, about many of these issues, and it seemed like a good time for us to sort of write down some of the ideas that we had. So what are some of the ideas? I mean, the first paragraph is, is I, I see some very Sidney phrases in here where he's um, um, less than happy about a number of what he would call the omic sciences, connectomics, synaptomics, and all the omic sciences, which seem to be splitting the field into, into ever smaller pieces. Um, I know that's not the intent, that eventually it'll all come together again, perhaps, but could you, could you speak to that? Well, it's, it's clear that, uh, it, and we, it actually, we do say that uh, the, the omic sciences uh, are absolutely necessary. There's, there's no doubt that having the, the human genome was a great uh, advance uh, but one that wasn't, didn't immediately lead to any uh, immediate insight or curing any diseases, uh, but rather served as the foundation for uh, all the work that's been done since then. It's basically uh, meant that instead of having to go and clone a gene, uh, all you have to do is go to a database and then uh, search for it and then compare it to other genes. And, and so it's, it's really changing the way people do science. Uh, but it, there's still all the hard work that needs to be done in terms of getting ideas, testing ideas, uh, but now with a much broader uh, database. And I think he makes it an important distinction, and this is something that uh, we, we, we had great long discussions about, and this distinction between uh, knowledge and understanding. Now, in other words, having a catalog uh, is knowledge. Being able to say, you know, how every uh, say protein interacts with another protein or binds to DNA, is 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 knowledge. However, that doesn't necessarily mean you've understood a signaling pathway. You have understood a, how a neuron works or encodes information. That requires synthesizing all of that knowledge into some uh, higher uh, form. And in, in particular case of uh, the research that I do myself, it's putting that into a model, a model system that allows you to, uh, to be able to uh, understand how the parts interact with each other and, and what sort of complex behaviors emerge from those interactions. So uh, I mean, you talk here about all the, all the various sciences now which have the prefix neuro, like we have neuroeconomics, neuroethics, uh, neurophilosophy, and so on and so forth. Um, just speak to the notion of whether that's surprising or not, because a lot of people are worried by it. I think they, they, they sense this reductionist notion. I mean, you're Francis Crick Professor Francis himself in The Astonishing Hypothesis. Do you remember that, that quote of his? It, which, which quote was that? The one about um, that the astonishing part, that, that everything you do, your emotions and so on. Oh and yes, so, of course. That, 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 yeah, but, but uh, simply, you're, you're nothing but, but a pack but, of neurons. But as you know, uh, he spent the last part of his scientific career studying consciousness, which is on the opposite spectrum of uh, reductionist science but trying to understand how all of the complex uh, uh, aspects of, 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 of visual awareness were a consequence of the interactions between all the neurons in the visual system. And, uh, and, and one of the things that Francis, I think, put an enormous amount of time and effort into was studying visual neuroanatomy, which uh, is, has been reinvented uh, in the form of connectomics. 
That, that's the, the new word for understanding the wiring diagram of the brain. And, and it's clear that you know, knowing that is very important, but uh, again, it's, it's, it may be necessary, but it's not going to be sufficient for understanding the function and, and understand how visual awareness arises from those networks. How do you reassure, when, when you give public talks and so on and so forth, presumably people come up to you and, and, and they're, they're interested to know how, how this kind of thing can possibly, how these kind of sciences can possibly explain individual differences. People as individuals, uh, people with taste and qualia, people want to have free will and so on and so forth. Um, those, are, those are really tricky topics to... to well, those, those are all fascinating topics and they're ones that uh, are, are at the uh, forefront right now of, uh, I think, um, debate. Uh, for example, you know, neuroethics and uh, how that impacts on our judicial system. Uh, th there's just a lot of very difficult questions that um, are going to be yeah, I mean, I, these, these, this is nothing uh, special. If this is just happens to be this month's, some some magazines or this. So there's there's a piece in here about about uh, dreaming and a, another piece about free will. This is Nature for for the for September, the Thinking Machine, Neuroscience and the Mystery of Free Will. Um, here, one of the one of the critiques in today's New York Times. Um, of the notion that neuroscience can explain everything. Uh, there's this, this whole notion and exchange between Alex Rosenberg Berg and Willie Meginton, bo Bodies in Motion, in, on the blog in, on, on the New York Times. And there's a comment here from one of the people um, who's basically saying, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, he's basically saying that um, you can't possibly reduce things. Considering this, you're study, consider this, you're studying a man's brain, you see some nerves light up. What did that man think? You have to ask him in order to find out. In this, the subject can identify the object, thus make it an inherently subjective approach to learning what certain en endings can do. Well, if you pick up The Economist and look in The Economist at this piece here, mind goggling, it is now possible to scan someone's brain and get a reasonable idea of what is going through his mind. Well, uh, th I think this is the, uh, the beginning of a new era where, in fact, uh, we will be able to peer into people's minds. I don't think we necessarily would be able to uh, decipher their, you know, the details of their thoughts, but certainly in broad outline, we'll be able to understand uh, whether they're having, uh, imagining a, an image. In fact, this is one of the articles that was quoted there, which was really quite remarkable. From current biology, I think, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, I want to go back to this fundamental distinction between knowledge and understanding. So neuroscientists have unearthed an enormous amount of information, details, about how the, the brain is organized and how the, all the, the little neurons and different parts of the brain. Just in the retina itself, there's a hundred different types of neurons, and, uh, and that's one of the simpler circuits. So we, we, we're, we've made a lot of progress because we now have names for all those neurons, and we know pretty much how they're connected. I mean, there's some details we don't know yet, but we're, we're, we're almost there. But that still doesn't uh, equate to a, a complete understanding of the function of the retina and what uh, all those different neurons are, uh, are doing. There are just, there are two dozen Amerkin cells. We have only the faintest idea of maybe how one or two of them are integrated into the circuit. We, we know. Uh, but the, 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 the point, though, is that there's still a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it from the perspective of uh, we're really good at uh, taking things apart. So, you know, when, when you took apart your father's watch, I don't know if you've ever done that, but um, I remember doing that. It's a lot more difficult to put it back together. <laughs> and, uh, in, and in a sense, having a computer model, which is something that I work on, uh, allows you to do that in the computer. It's, it's a way of synthesizing all of the pieces and trying to integrate them together. And it's what a biochemist would do when they reconstitute the function of a biochemical system to prove that they actually have all the pieces, that they haven't let anything out. They, sent, they purify each piece and then they mix them back in the test tube and they see whether or not uh, the, sun, the function has been reconstituted. And in a sense, by having a computer model that takes all those pieces and connects them up in the way that they're uh, we, we think they're connected in the brain, and by giving them properties that neurons have, and by giving them the right inputs, and seeing whether or not we can recapitulate and re reproduce some of, some of the output patterns and the behaviors coming out of those networks, I think that will give us a little bit of confidence that we actually are beginning to understand the circuits. 
I think one of the panels, as I recall, that comes up at the Society for Neuroscience meeting is about neuro law, neuro neuroscience and the law. And uh, again, that's a, that's a very tricky area. I mean, how much can you actually import neuroscientific findings into the courtroom? Uh, is, is this something you've, you've also thought about? Because we've done this in the Beyond Belief meetings as well. This is your brain on law, remember? That's true. Uh, it, it's a hot topic. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, th there's going to be a real revolution because, of, and, and by the way, it's not just neuroscience. It's also cognitive science as well uh, and psychology. Uh, you know, th th these are all different different perspectives on, on the brain. The brain, the brain, the behavior of the brain, the, the the, the, how, the, how the brain is, uh, it develops, how does it evolve, those, those are all important parts. And just to give you one example, uh, we've already known now for quite a while that eyewitness testimony is very unreliable. And, and psychologists have f figured out a lot of the things that bias witnesses, you know, just the way evidence is presented can bias a witness. And of course, lawyers have known this all along because that's how they, they apply their trade. But uh, you know, we're beginning to understand why the brain is, is fallible to these, uh, these, these distortions. And, and so once we've understood that, we might be able to try to uh, uh, prevent uh, biases from happening, at least uh, the ones that we're aware of. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused. I, there's, there's this sort of dichotomous position here in the sense that if you take something like education, um, recent Scientific American piece, How to Build a Better Learner. That's a phrase we've been using at the Temple Dynamics of Learning Center here at UCSD. Um, it's something we've been using, you and I and Paula Talal, with the XPRIZE Foundation in terms of a New York Education XPRIZE. And the, the basic thesis is that instead of complaining about bad school teachers or school boards, you say, what can you do to build a better learner? And the answer is to optimize the three pounds of wonder tissue you've got up here. Obviously, you've got, it's, obviously it's to do with the brain, right? So um, that's, that's clear, although it's situated in the body as well. So, so people are very enthusiastic about that. And they, 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 they clearly sense that neuroscience has something to offer. But then they also balk at the neuroscience intruding too much into, into their own control of the situation. So uh, it, this is just a matter of time, you think, of getting used to it. Because if you look at the bookshelves now, there's dozens of books out there in which how brain science can explain fill in the blank. Uh, so th it, there's plainly a movement going on, but there's, there's d unease at the same time, I think. Well, there's a lot of uh, excitement, and, uh, it, and you know, as we do make progress, there's no doubt that it's going to have uh, implications for the classroom. However, it's not going to be a direct um, connection. Uh, there's much more to classrooms that we've learned from TDLC than just uh, f f stuffing facts into a brain. Uh, there's a lot, there's social interactions that are occurring, mm -hmm. social interactions between students, social interactions with the teacher, uh, enormously complicated uh, dynamics. And uh, if we want to really understand the brain, we need to understand it in the context, both of the uh, classroom, uh, of the uh, parents, the family, the home, uh, and, and, and those are uh, very, very difficult uh, uh, laboratories. Uh, you can't go into a home and instrument it and, and try to uh, collect all the data that you would really like to have because that might give you some hint as to how different home lives may influence different uh, brains to learn or, or not learn. And, uh, and we're going to have to do that. At some point, we're going to have to bite the bullet. Uh, what's really exciting right now is th the fact that uh, social media is collecting an enormous amount of data uh, about people's preferences and how they interact with each other. Uh, people are carrying around very powerful computers that can monitor the environments that they're in, where they are, how they spend their time. Uh, it should be possible in, in, in their future really to, f to actually study education in a scientific way, in a, in a way that hasn't been possible up until recently because it was very expensive and very difficult. So I, I saw a paper very recently. There was uh, one of the authors was Geraint Rees, okay, and it was in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London. And if I'm remembering correctly, it was basically saying that depending upon your Facebook number, your FBN, <laughs> the higher the number that you had, the more connections, more friends, 
um, that was producing distinct changes in certain brain areas. There was a greater density of, in, in certain brain areas. I mean, do you find, are you, do you find that um, um, understandable? It's not surprising? We know, and we have known for a long time, that uh, the experience that you have leaves an imprint in the brain uh, and uh, it, 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 in a very direct way. And uh, it can uh, change your synapses. Uh, recently, we discovered that learning can change the volume of white matter, which are the connections between neurons, not the actual uh, synapses that make the connection, but rather the long wires that uh, course through the, the brain. And 80% and of the of the, of the cortex really is, is, is white matter. Uh, it's not uh, the thin gray layer that uh, everyone identifies when they, when they see the outside of the brain. And that means that uh, the, those, the signals that are going back and forth across those connections uh, are also, in a sense, adapting to the experiences that you've had. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there was strong correlations. Now, understanding the causal connection is, is something that we don't understand. What was it about that? Facebook experience that caused that particular area or that particular, um, you know, change that, that was registered. Uh, in fact, uh, the more we look at the brain, the more we realize how dynamic it is. Mm -hmm. It's not just a static piece of hardware sitting there with information flowing through and being stored. Rather, it's actually is, is being constantly reorganized. All of that information is constantly being reorganized. Every time you recall a memory from the past, you've modified it. And uh, reconsolidation, this is a very, very uh, important topic, especially for false memories that uh, have been implanted in people, uh, that things that never happened but make you feel as if they did because you've been told about them enough times so that you really feel that you had that experience. So, th so we really need, and this is what we're, we're getting to right now, is uh, to understand uh, if there is so much dy dynamism, then the question becomes, how is there any stability? How is it that you can have memories that last a lifetime, given the fact that synapses are turning over, uh, there's tremendous amount of uh, a re the trafficking within neurons in terms of uh, where the, the resources are going. Um, and and that's, that's really exciting, because I, I think we're, we're going to have some surprises. Well, yeah, but slide off, friend, but let's follow that one, because that really, I, I've asked a lot of people on Science Network as, as we've gone through, Joe Ledoux, Liz Phelps, and so on. And this, this, is a, this is a conundrum, uh, as you said. The, there's this turnover going on. If when you access a memory, you're effectively changing the memory, how can you, at the end of your life, have any reliable sense, any sense that the, the, the memories that you have of your childhood are in, in any way reliable? Why hasn't everything been changed? What mechanism could possibly allow those, that, that kind of turnover to be happening, and yet you, you, you still have some stability as a coherent individual over time? Well, the, the uh, structural uh, memory is probably uh, the, the longest lasting. Uh, for example, um, your face. Um, it, 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 as you get older, it, it changes in, in, a very, in a very predictable way. But there are features of your face that you could recognize throughout your entire life, that there's a certain structural organization. And that, that structure, in the sense of you know, bones and tissue and so forth, that has a memory. But my best example, in terms of uh, an analogy, to try to understand you know, what might be going on in terms of long-term memory, is I'll bet there's a scar on your body that is almost as old as you are. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and when scars heal, they leave behind some tissue, some, there you go. They, they, they leave behind um, uh, keratin and collagen, and, and, and it, it, it just stays, okay? It's very, very tough, and it's, 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 it's there for your lifetime. So uh, it, it may well be there is material like that somewhere, uh, perhaps at the synapses, uh, maybe even what's, and what's called the extracellular matrix, which is the uh, glycoproteins that actually bind together neurons at synapses, that those form very, very tight, long-lasting, uh, very, very tough to dissolve uh, t uh, scars in inside of the, uh, your brain that could be the source of your long-term memories. Now, that's just a speculation, but that's where I would uh, put my money if I had to bet on the actual uh, structural foundation for where those memories are stored uh, in terms of the the actual material. 
Now, uh, the, 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 you know, you can, it's really, it's quite fascinating to think about this because you can uh, cool someone's brain down and it happens, right, when people are in comas. So there's no activity, there's no, there's no electrical activity. There's still metabolic activity. But, you know, the person comes back and, and they can recall the past and may, maybe they have some retrograde amnesia. But it's, it's amazing that, that all of that has to be somewhere in the structure of the brain. So, um, just to summarize at this point, uh, um, and, and as you go off to the Society of Neuroscience meeting, what, what are the things that you're most excited about, or, or you and Sydney together, in terms of, of, of which areas of research are you particularly excited about? in terms of the neuroscience? Well, I, I am very um, excited about the potential for studying the human brain. In fact, that's the title of the article. So for most of the history of neuroscience, uh, the only way that you could study the human brain was really uh, f following uh, lesions or uh, uh, you know, genetic diseases. Uh, you know disorders, epilepsy, and uh, and that's a very crude way of of trying to approach the human brain. Uh, one of the things that Francis was very uh, concerned about was that most of our anatomy is based not on humans, but on animal models like monkeys, mm -hmm. and 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 to lesser extent chimpanzees, our nearest relatives, because you couldn't do the invasive experiments on humans to find out where the fiber tracks are located, and and so the monkey brain though is 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 quite a bit smaller and less complex than the human brain. And now, and for the first time, we are beginning to develop techniques that allow us to do non-invasive track tracing using diffusion tensor imaging. And that's getting better and better. This is using uh, brain imaging techniques, uh, 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 magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, ex uh, uh, explosion occurring right now in areas that had been abandoned in the 50s, uh, EEG and MEG, so electroencephalography and magnetoencephalography, these are external signals that you can measure at the scalp. And now with powerful computer and new algorithms uh, such as independent component analysis and multi-beam forming, it's now possible to locate the sources of those signals with a very high spatial temporal resolution, the spatial resolution is still isn't as good as you'd like to have it, both coupled with functional magnetic resonance imaging, which has the spatial resolution. It should be possible now to begin to understand the traffic that's occurring between different brain areas. And uh, the, the, one of the most exciting things uh, I've heard recently in this area was from uh, Tom Liu in our um, uh, fMRI center here at UCSD, who said that uh, it's been possible to identify 50 independent networks in the brain that are, are coupled together, different brain areas that are coupled together, that uh, are processing information that are very dynamically uh, in flux all the time, uh, including the default arresting network, which happens when you're not processing information. Mm -hmm. so, so this is really an exciting time because now we're gonna be getting a, a real global picture of all of the, of the flow of information through different brain areas up until the advent of brain imaging, we were stuck recording from one neuron at a time, and there's only so much you can learn from one neuron in terms of what it, uh, its function. Uh, you know, you can tell something about uh, what sensory stimuli, stimulus it prefers, or maybe what motor output it might be contributing to, but in terms of understanding something as complex as perception or consciousness, you know, you need to have a much more global picture of all the interacting neurons. But what about some of the experiments, and, and, and again, there's, there's some recent papers just came out again, although they've been doing some of this for some, some time now, Christoph Koch, Yitzhak Fried, and so on, recording from... Um, One neuron at a time. Okay, so there's the same fundamental during, limitation. You know, you have to understand, okay, here's an analogy, which I, I heard recently, which I, I think is, is, is it's the way to think about it, is that a cortical column, which contains about 100,000 neurons, is like an orchestra. They're all, all the neurons are firing and, and playing a symphony together. In other words, they're not just isolated, uh, independent of each other, they're connected with each other, and so they, they, they have a temporal sequence, and they are representing very complex brain states. And up until recently, it's like shoving a telephone pole down, and you know, you know, you're, you're, you're going through all this tissue, and you pick out one, of, one instrument, from 100,000, and you listen to it and said, what's the tune, what's the tune? Well, you'll never figure it out. 
And, and then, you know, we, we, but then the great advance occurred when it was possible to put two telephone poles down and to record from two neurons. But unfortunately, they were in different columns and they, they're playing different tunes. So now you're really confused because, you know, they, have nothing, they may have nothing to do with each other. So it, it, until we can re record densely from a large population of neighboring neurons that are all in the same uh, symphony orchestra, we won't have any clue as to how they're working together to form populations of neurons and, 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 and the space-time patterns of spikes that we'll need to understand the code. Yeah. Do you ever do you foresee a time when you'd have a, a technique like optogenetics that would be applicable to humans where you can actually be tracing? Well, you're a little behind because uh, optogenetics now are being, is being used on humans. In fact, Carl Dyserroth, who's yes. a psychiatrist, actually developed it because he wanted to go in and be able to selectively uh, stimulate different neurons. And, and uh, one of the most exciting advances in, uh, you know, at least uh, you know, in, in, in uh, the clinical side of uh, uh, mental disorders has been deep brain stimulation, mm -hmm. where again, you put a big telephone pole <laughs> down into the, well, some brain area and you just stimulate the bejesus out of it. And it helps in ways that we don't understand. It helps Parkinson's disease, helps with depression. It, it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a great advance. However, it's, it's very crude. What Carl wants to do is to use optogenetics to selectively target uh, a particular subset of cells in a particular brain area, and then using opto means light, you shine blue light, you can either stimulate or uh, you can suppress the activity, and now you can go in and, and fine tune the system and perhaps even uh, uh, you know, alleviate some of these disorders with much more precision. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't state that clearly because we, we actually have a conversation with Carl on the Science Network, so, so I, I knew about that part of it. And we also had a conversation with Helen Mayberg. So I should that, keep up with the Science <laughs> Network. <so. laughs> with Helen Mayberg, who of course was... The depression part. Uh, yeah. Who did the deep brain stimulation as well. But I was think, what I was trying to say, and I didn't phrase it properly, was whether those kind of techniques, as they become even more, um, more sophisticated, um, what kind of a picture of brain do you think that they will reveal? Um, what, kind of a, it, 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 what kind of a computational device do you think that will be emerging? It's, uh, I, I would say, you know, um, if I had the answer to that, I would publish it. <laughs> 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 if I had some good ideas. No, I, 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 I do think that um, we have to um, start thinking in a different way. In other words, up until now, we've thought about how the brain works from the perspective of single neurons. And it's right. clear that, the, that the, the, the real mysteries of the brain, which have to do, and that's taken us a long way, by the way. I mean, there's nothing, we have a whole map now of all the different cortical areas that we didn't have before. But, but now the question is, you know, how do you get a unified percept out of all that? You have you know, millions of neurons that are activated, different parts of the brain. How, how, how do they, you get the, the sense of an integrated, uh, you know, visual, auditory, somatosensory, you know, world out there that you can uh, understand in, in some integrated way. And that's, that's a big mystery. And that's, that's where I think understanding something about global communication between different parts of the brain is going to be key to understanding that. So that means being able to record from lots of neurons from lots of different brain areas in, 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 in real time, at, at online, and, and then be able to use advanced uh, computational techniques and algorithms, machine learning, to try to sort out from that, you know, what are the what are the relative what are the signals there that are, are shifting and changing in time that are, are computing, representing, deciding all the things that we see in, in terms of reflected in behavior. But we're we're not there yet. But we have techniques, and they're going to be getting more and more powerful. So I, I'm confident that we'll be able to make progress. So, a final question. Um, the, we talked about the, 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 the orchestra, the symphony. I actually did a program some years ago um, called The Time of Our Lives, in which I used, uh, I got the Los Angeles Youth Symphony to metaphorically represent this, this whole enterprise, and Marlo Schifrin conducted them. Um, but the question then was, who's conducting the orchestra? Uh, and, and in the same way, um, does this, how do you get an orchestra to perform, I know it was a metaphor, but nevertheless it is doing all this synchrony and so on. How does it do it without a conductor? Well, um, I think that if you took a symphony orchestra and had them 
playing together long enough, my guess is the conductor can walk off <laughs> and, and the symphony will go on. <laughs> Maybe not quite as well in terms of the integration, but uh, you know, the, he obviously gives a timing signal and you could replace the conductor with a, a timing signal. And obviously there's some dynamic dynamics he's indicating, but you know, the, 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 that, it, it seems to me once you have a very well-oiled machine that really has it sort of internalized all of those dynamics and, and understands how the neighboring players are going to react. My guess is that you know you could probably get some pretty good music out of it. Well, I look forward to hearing about the music that's, that comes out of the Society for Neuroscience meeting next week. And uh, well, that's a good example of a conductorless <laughs> symphony. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, thanks for talking to us. You're very welcome. Great. We are just down the road from the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California at the Estancia La Jolla Spa and Hotel with Terry Sanofsky, who's a Francis Crick Professor and Head of the Computational Neurobiology Lab at the Salk, Head of the Institute for Neural Computation over at UCSD and a Howard Hughes Medical in Institute investigator and one of only 10 living individuals, I think, who, who are members of all three nat national institutes. So it's great to have you here. The, there is an editorial um, on the 4th November issue of Science, which you did with Sidney Brenner, and it's called Understanding the Human Brain. And I would like to know, first, give me a quick summary of this. Why now? Why, why did you feel it was important to do this at this point? Well, every year the Society for Neuroscience has a major annual meeting. Uh, this year it will be in Washington. And it's the distinction between uh, knowledge and understanding. In other words, having a catalog uh, is knowledge. Ha being able to t t t say, uh, you know, how every uh, say protein interacts with another protein or binds to DNA, is 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 knowledge. However, that doesn't necessarily mean you've understood a signaling pathway. You have understood a, how a neuron works or encodes information. That requires synthesizing all of that knowledge into some. Uh, a higher uh, form, and, and in particular case of uh, the research that I do myself, it's putting that into a model, a model system that allows you to, uh, to be able to uh, understand how the parts interact with each other and, and what sort of complex behaviors emerge from those interactions. So uh, I mean, you talk here about all the, all the various sciences now which have the prefix neuro, like we have neuroeconomics, neuroethics, uh, neurophilosophy and so on and so forth. Um, just speak to the notion of whether that... In D.C., if 35,000 neuroscientists and exhibitors converge and uh, exchange the latest uh, results and advances in, in neuroscience, and it's uh, hard to even uh, comprehend how, um, how much is being done. And uh, every year, Science Magazine has a special issue timed for that meeting. And uh, this was a guest editorial. Uh, Sidney Brenner is a senior fellow in the Crick Jacobs Center for Theoretical and Computational Biology that I direct. And uh, we have had a dialogue over the last five years uh, about many of these issues. And it seemed like a good time for us to sort of write down some of the ideas that we had. So what are some of the ideas? I mean, the first paragraph is, is I, I see some very Sidney phrases in here where he's um, um, less than happy about a number of what he would call the omic sciences, connectomics, synaptomics, and all the omic sciences, which seem to be splitting the field into surprising or not, because a lot of people are worried by it. I think they, they, they sense this reductionist notion. I mean, you're Francis Crick Professor Francis himself in The Astonishing Hypothesis. Do you remember that, that quote of his? Which, which quote was that? The one about... Um, that the astonishing part, that, that everything you do, your emotions and so on. Oh and yes, so. of course. Yeah, that, that, yeah. But but uh, simply, you're, you're nothing but, but a pack but, of neurons. But as you know, uh, he spent the last part of his scientific career studying consciousness, which is on the opposite spectrum of uh, reductionist science. But trying to understand how all of the complex uh, <clears throat> aspects of of, of of visual awareness 
were a consequence of the interactions between all the neurons in the visual system. And, uh, and, and one of the things that Francis, I think, put an enormous amount of time and effort into was studying visual neuroanatomy, which uh, is, has been reinvented uh, in the form of connectomics. That, that's the, the new word for understanding the wiring diagram of the brain. And, and to, into ever smaller pieces. Um, I know that's not the intent, but eventually it'll all come together again, perhaps. But could you, could you speak to that? Well, it's, it's clear that, uh, it, and we, it actually, we do say that uh, the, the omic sciences uh, are absolutely necessary. There's, there's no doubt that having the, the human genome was a great uh, advance, uh, but one that wasn't, didn't immediately lead to any uh, immediate insight or curing any diseases, uh, but rather served as the foundation for uh, all the work that's been done since then. It's basically uh, meant that instead of having to go and clone a gene, uh, all you have to do is go to a database and then uh, search for it and then compare it to other genes. And, and so it's, it's really changing the way people do science, uh, but it, there's still all the hard work that needs to be done in terms of getting ideas, testing ideas. Uh, but now with a much broader uh, database. And I think he makes it an important distinction, and this is something that uh, we, we, we had great long discussions about.